Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I interrupted some of your lunches, and now I realize why the response wasn't as vigorous as it might have been, because you're uh, having lunch. But uh, it's good to see some of you here at lunch. I saw some of you at breakfast. Um, and uh, I think you're in for a real treat uh, along with your, with, with your lunch. Uh, since I joined the Annenberg School uh, as the dean five years ago, uh, my colleagues and I have stressed the importance of ensuring that our students have an opportunity to work in this great community uh, in, which we, in which we live. As you know, uh, Los Angeles is, is a great city. It's probably the most diverse and global city in the United States of America when you think about it, and maybe one of the most global and diverse in the entire world. And so it's a wonderful laboratory for us to try out our, uh, the work that we do in journalism and communication and public relations, and uh, for us to learn about operating in a multicultural world and a multicultural uh, environment. Um, I also want to mention that in today's discussion, Professor Willis Seidenberg uh, on my far left and Robert Hernandez will share their experience in managing two of our hyperlocal news laboratories. And they will explain what hyperlocal uh, means. It's a pretty exciting concept. And then as I mentioned this morning, as a reminder, immediately following this discussion, you are invited to Annenberg 207, right upstairs and back that way, um, to view a very interesting exhibit, which I've been looking at myself over the past couple of days. And it's called Our Neighborhood, Our Stories. And it was done by the students themselves. It's a very moving, powerful uh, presentation of life in our, in our community here. And it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was a, a class project that, was, that uh, Professor Hernandez did. And I know he'll tell you more about that. Uh, as a way to kind of connect our students with, with the great community in which we find ourselves. To get the discussion started, uh, I would like to introduce Professor Judy Muller, who will moderate today's discussion. Um, she is con a contributing correspondent to public television news um, and a, a 2010 winner of Columbia DuPont Award and a Peabody Award winner as well. When I came in today, I said, hi, Judy, good to see you. What awards have you won this morning? because uh, almost every time I open up my email, it says that Professor Muller has won this award or she's won that award, and she really has, uh, her response was she's taking a break to give other people a chance to, uh, <laughs> to win an award or two. But she is really, ha is one of our most accomplished faculty. She's, uh, uh, speaking of awards, she's won national and regional Emmy awards. She's been a commentator for NPR's Morning Edition former ABC news correspondent with Nightline and a number of other um, very, very important programs, former CBS correspondent, and has a really cool new book, which probably has the coolest title <laughs> of any book published this year. And I'm going to, Emus Loose in Egnar, Big Stories from Small Towns. <laughs> Emus Loose, uh, that's, I mean, that's just pretty cool, right? So without further ado, let me turn it over to my, uh, to my colleague, Judy, Professor Julie Muller, and ask her to uh, introduce our presenters. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. This is terrific. And uh, we love talking about what we do with the students. And this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, let me begin uh, with the word that, that Ernie's already thrown out there, hyper-local. And that's sort of the buzzword of our profession right now. And I'm sure, as many of you probably noticed, a lot of the major media outlets are, are suffering the loss of advertising revenue and subscribers, in part because the internet has um, taken a lot of the uh, readers away. Uh, various other media, plat media platforms are, are digging into that base. So uh, there's one area of news coverage, however, that has really withstood this assault. And that is the kind of news that we can't get anywhere else except from reporters who are telling stories about the neighborhoods and communities we live in. And that's called hyperlocal news. Ironically, 
since Ernie brought up my book, um, old-fashioned weekly newspapers in small communities and towns across America have been hyper-local for decades without ever using the word. And uh, it's probably no surprise that the 8,000 weeklies in this country are doing quite well, thank you very much, because they give news that you can't get from any place else. Um, so that's, my book is about weekly newspapers in America, and I found that they are actually, in most cases, thriving, not just surviving. And it's because they provide something you can't get anywhere else. Uh, what we want to share with you today is the way our young journalists at Annenberg are learning how to cover the community surrounding the university and learning how to find important and compelling stories that no one else is covering. And believe me, even in a major city like Los Angeles, where you would think, with so ma many major media outlets, certain neighborhoods, however, rarely get covered, unless something scary or scandalous happens. And of course, if you get Lindsay Lohan, you get both of those in one. So, you know, why go anywhere else? But, um, so there's a, a ripe, uh, <laughs> fertile ground for reporting uh, stories that nobody else is really looking at. So I want to introduce you to um, a pair of indefatigable, hyperlocal aficionados on our faculty, Willis Seidenberg and Robert Hernandez, who are going to talk about ways in which they're immersing students in this living laboratory of neighborhood reporting. Um, and a Willis program is Intersections, that's Community News website, and Roberts is a course, Intro to Online Media, in which students use the latest technology to report on local neighborhoods, and I'm gonna uh, introduce them one at a time in a moment. I also wanna mention two other hyper-local news operations we operate through Annenberg, and one is Alhambra Source. That's a multilingual news website where community members working with a professional journalist report on the city of Alhambra. And that site posts content in English, Chinese, and Spanish. And it is Alhambra's only independent local news source. And, and that's through partnership with Annenberg. And I also want to give a tip of the hat to Boyle Heights Beat. That's this newspaper. It is a bilingual quarterly newspaper produced by high school students for the Boyle Heights community, predominantly Latino community of about 90,000 people. And that paper also has a website and is produced through a partnership of Annenberg and La Opinion. The Annenberg director of that program, Michelle Lavander, has graciously dropped off copies of the paper for you. Uh, so if you want to grab one afterwards, be our guest. And after this brief presentation, we really want to open this up to questions from you. Um, and, and so I encourage you as you listen to our two presenters to be thinking of things you'd like to ask. So now to our speakers. Willis Seidenberg's an associate professor of professional practice in broadcast journalism. She spent almost 25 years working in local public uh, radio and television news. What's going on with my mic? Okay. Um, before coming to Annenberg in 2000. She's the director of Annenberg Radio News, give a shout out, a learning lab in which students get practice producing a live radio newscast covering local issues. She's also the co-founder and director of Intersection South LA. It's a community website for South Los Angeles and that's what she's gonna be sharing with you today. Willa? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, it's nice to see all of you here and welcome to Annenberg, um, which I like to always say, we're like the little college in the big university. We're a very kind of intimate school and we're a school that, at least in the journalism school, where we get to know our students really well. Um, when I first came, um, can you guys switch the page on the screen? When I first came to Annenberg in uh, January of 2000, it's hard to believe I've been here almost 12 years, um, I found that our students rarely went into South Los Angeles, and I think probably most of you know we are located in South Los Angeles. We are part of the South Los Angeles community. Um, people just, students just didn't go to the community to report stories. and. Frankly, professors didn't make them go. And I, I found that really strange because it's right in our backyard, as, the, as our talk uh, says. Um, they go all over the place, but usually they go to places where they found people who were just like them. And one of the things about being a journalist uh, is that 
we don't just cover people who are just like us. We have to learn how to cover communities and people who are much different than us. And we always talk about uh, having to go outside of our comfort zone. And that's one of the things that we as journalists need to do. Because if we only covered what happened in uh, Bel Air or Beverly Hills or Glendale or Pasadena, we wouldn't be representing what happens in the whole city. Um, just as we, if we only reported on what happened in the United States and we didn't report on what happens in Africa or Asia, we wouldn't be doing our jobs. So it's really important as students are studying journalism that they learn how to be a part of covering the whole world and not just the part that they're comfortable with. So I found it really strange that our students didn't go. and. Um, so when we started, uh, I started intersections with uh, Professor Bill Sellis, who is also on the uh, uh, School of Journalism faculty and, uh, in fact, is now an associate director of the school. And one of the reasons why we uh, started it is that we wanted our students to go out into the community. Now, how many of you know about anything about South LA? How many of you have ever been to South LA, aside from USC? Okay, well that's actually pretty good for this, for this group, but many of our students, even the ones that grew up in LA, had, have never been, aside from USC and maybe the football stadium, have never been into South LA. And of course, they were fearful. Um, the, South LA has a reputation of, you know, you go in there and you park your car and it's not going to be there when you get back. Um, or you're going to get mugged the minute you walk outside. Um, and, and, you know, I don't mean to minimize that there aren't parts of South LA that are very dangerous, just as there are parts of the whole city that are dangerous. I don't, I live on the west side. I lock my door, I lock my car doors when I go inside at night. Um, I had a car stolen right in front, from my, right in front of my house in, in the west side. So we live in a big city. It's a big city that has lots of areas that you have to be careful in. South LA is no different. Um, but the, the, the fear that many students had about the community was sort of more than it warranted. Um, so we thought that if we could get our students to go into a community like South LA and learn how to report, learn how to find stories, learn how to find contacts and talk to people, if they could overcome that, they could really go anywhere and do the same thing. And I, I used to kind of joke that uh, if they could do it in South LA, they could go to Baghdad. Because for many of them, <coughs> South LA was as, as, as dangerous a place and as unknown of a place as it was covering a war zone. Um, and I know that that maybe sounds dramatic, but it was really true because that was just sort of the reputation that a lot of people have. Um, in addition, we thought that if we could get our students covering South LA, that we could get attention for their work because South LA is an underreported community. It's um, those of you who read the Los Angeles Times, you know that every now and then you'll see an article. Every now and then there'll be a series of stories that the LA Times will do about South LA. Um, Scott Gold recently did, well, maybe a few years ago, did a series called Promise and Peril where he was doing a lot of stories. But then that ends and and they're done. And so it's every now and then, I and mean, usually the news is, you know, a shooting, gang violence, uh, something having to do with poverty. And really, this is a community that has a lot more going than just that. Um, not that they don't have their share of crime. There is gang violence. There, there is drugs. There is prostitution. Um, there is poverty. There's great poverty. But there's also vibrancy. There's culture. And there's richness in that community. Um, so we figured if our students could get out there and report, then they maybe would be doing stories that would get picked up by other media because no one else is doing it. And in fact, that's part of what we found is that um, as a lot of the professional news media have had to retrench and they can't do the kinds of coverage that they want that they did in the past that they are looking at for other places to find content and we've had a lot of our stories that have been on intersections and a lot of the student media in the school as a whole that's been picked up by professional media um, and when we started um, when we started intersections we also knew that um, sort of mirroring what's happening in the world of journalism, where we are having to give up the kind of top-down uh, uh, reporting that, that we all 
sort of grew up with, where we as the journalists decide this is what's news in the community and this is what you're going to find out about, that we knew that we wanted this to be a partnership because this is a community that's underreported. This is a community that often feels like their community is not fully reported and the good things that happen in their community aren't, aren't talked about and the positive things aren't talked about. So we knew that we wanted to sort of collaborate with the community in, in doing this news. Um, so we decided to make this a very collaborative kind of website. So the website, which is, the, is there a link? If you guys click on intersections, maybe we could pull up the website. Oh, the mouse is right here. Pull the drawer. Okay. I can do it. Maybe if I can find the, there we go. There we go. I hope. Okay, there we go. Um, you're seeing only part of it, but uh, you're only seeing the very top part. Um, so the, the website features a collection of student journalism work. Um, we do uh, have quite a few students that, that contribute to the site in various ways. And then it also uh, features the work of community people who are either doing opinion pieces or um, you'll see in a minute, it will come up when you see the black and white photo. This is a, a slideshow that was done by a young man who lives in the Lamert Park area and is a photo student at uh, Otis School of Art. And he's been photographing Santa Barbara Plaza, which is a, um, uh, a development or a, an area right next to the Crenshaw Mall that for 25 years has been um, sort of stuck in, uh, in redevelopment. And nothing's been happening. It really actually looks like a big bombed out, oops, sorry, area. And this, this um, young man has been photographing, because he's a photographer, he's been photographing um, this area for several years as it started to go undergo a few little changes. And um, he did this slideshow and narrated um, his process of doing this. So we have that kind of content on there too. Um, just a little bit about um, South LA. I mean, as I said, there is this big fear factor. In addition to the fact that South LA is just not one of those places that's a destination in the city. Um, so people don't really know about it. I mean, some people, you know, uh, we were talking about Alhambra. Um, you know, people might go there because they want really good Chinese food or something like that. South LA doesn't attract people in that way. Um, and part of it is because of the fear. So a lot of people don't know about it. But there, and there isn't as much in the way of shopping and restaurants and destinations for people to go to. Um, that's probably gonna start turning around in the next few years, but that's been true, um, that's been true for, for a number of years. Um, demographically, South LA was uh, historically uh, a largely African American community, and in fact, one area of South LA, Lamert Park, is really considered the sort of African American cultural hub of Los Angeles. Um, and uh, much of the area was considered sort of black LA in a way. That's been changing too. Over the last 20 years, Latino immigrants, mostly from Central America, have been moving in. And so now you're getting this mix of, of black and Latino um, residents living in the city and that's causing lots of interesting stories to happen and interesting interactions and, you know, just, you know, really for a journalist, great stories to be told. Um, and that's the other thing that we try to talk about with our students is that these are stories that, you know, you, you don't get any better than this as a journalist because they're, they're very personal stories. There's, there's, there's economic stories. There's religion, stories about religion. There's stories about poverty. There's stories about culture. There's everything there. And it's right at your fingertips. Tips. Um, so just a little bit, because I wanted to talk about the whole hyper-local. When we first started, we, there was such a need for this kind of coverage in this community. And we actually started also covering Compton and Inglewood, which are not part of Los Angeles. They're actually, they're part of LA County, but not the city of Los Angeles. They're their own cities. But we also found such a need there that we couldn't sort of resist also covering those communities as well as Watts. Um, and at a certain point, we had to look at each other and say, uh, we're not, we're covering such a big area. We are not hyper-local. I mean, we are, in fact, we were working with a um, hyper-local researcher who was at the school for a year last year, and he's from Finland. And he said, 
that would be like covering most of Finland. Um, so, you know, you're not hyper-local. And, and we had to kind of say, yeah, yeah, that's true. And so we've really decided we have to kind of pull back a little and, and, and sort of limit our outreach so that we can do a really good job in a smaller area. And as we can do a good job in that area, maybe we can expand out a little bit. Um, there's not a lot, of, a lot of other media. There's some other media in the area, but not a huge amount. Um, we do try to work with, for instance, in Lamert Park, there is a, um, a website called Lamert Park Beat, and we have a very strong relationship with them. And in fact, that, that Santa Barbara Plaza that, that I was talking about, we did a project with them uh, under spotus.org, which is a um, program where it's sort of like a... It's like a microfinance for journalism, where you know you put a project up on a website and people can contribute to it. They can contribute ten dollars. They can contribute a hundred. So we put that up as a as a joint partnership with Lamert Part B, and we did a whole series of stories about this plaza, um, and. Uh, um, so you know we we do try to partner with other media. Um, so we're really trying to get back uh, to you know being a little bit more confined in what we're doing. We're trying to concentrate on the area around around. Oh, sorry, this thing I keep hitting um, around USC and um, and really trying to saturate that area, get people reading us. But and every every week we're we're getting more and more people who are coming to the site. We're pretty well known among a lot of the stakeholders, the city council members and a lot of other people, but we're really trying to get to the residents who live there. One of our big issues that we have is that as the population is becoming much more Spanish speaking, that we are going to need to respond to that and we're going to need to have content in Spanish. Um, we haven't really had the bandwidth to do that yet. Um, so we, we've, made, we've been an English site, but we will need to eventually start getting into, and we're also trying to sort of dip our toes into that, but we need to not only have more Spanish speaking, Spanish language content, but we need to reach the people who aren't necessarily at home going on their computers because they might not have computers at home. So one of the things that we need to think about is how do we reach those people with mobile phone content because many of those people don't have computers, but they have phones and they can get content on their phones. And so that's a really important thing for us to, um, to think about. And just before I close, because I want to just let everybody have a chance for questions, and I, I want to hear about Robert's project, but just in, in the hyper-local um, vein is just to give you an idea of how, how big this population is. If we look at three zip codes that are around USC, 9007, 90018, and 90037, the population of just those three zip codes is almost 180,000. Um, and so it's a very, and that's not including other zip codes in the South LA region. So it's a very densely populated area. So trying to cover that, mu that many people and trying to get news that, that covers that kind of population it requires a tremendous amount of work. Um, to give you a comparison, uh, Alhambra is about 83,000, I think. Um, so it's a big difference in the kind of population that we're trying to cover. But we try to kind of keep with the hyper-local theme in that we're trying to be uh, a website that not only brings news, and information, but also resources, uh, much the way I think Judy would would talk about the way the community papers through the years have done it. So that maybe it's a place you come for not just for news, but maybe if you you know uh, need to find what, what the closest church to you is, or where the closest um, ATM or cash cash check um, or what do they call them cash checking stations are, that you would be able to come to our website and and find that information. So we're also thinking, and so that means that we're extending beyond being just journalists, but also how do we be a resource for this community? So I'm going to turn it over to, I guess, back to Judy. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Thank you. Robert Hernandez is Assistant Professor of Professional Practice. He was a longtime online news developer for the Seattle Times, served as web designer and consultant for an El Salvador paper, a web producer for the San Francisco Chronicle, and the online editor of the San Francisco Examiner. 
looked much too young for doing all <laughs> His online hyper-local reporting course has produced some amazing work. Ernie mentioned this, but it's some of which you can see in a wonderful exhibit on our second floor in the West Wing. I hope you get up there today because it's, it's fabulous. Please welcome Robert Hernandez. Thank you all for coming out and joining us. Um, you know, a lot of folks call me a nerd, a geek, a tech fanboy. You can call me those things without a doubt, but the first thing you should call me is a journalist. Uh, when I came and joined um, USC and, and took over the class of intro to online uh, journalism, online media, I could have taken the approach of teach the Twitters and Facebook and a little HTML and this coding and what have you. Um, but we're journalists here and we're a journalism school in addition to a PR school and a comm school. Um, when I started out my first semester here, I had students do an audio story and, and I was a bit disappointed in what they came up with. Uh, they interviewed their roommate. They interviewed their fraternity brother. Great but not what I would call journalism. At the time, I'm actually from the San Fernando Valley originally, uh, and like how some folks have said, coming to downtown LA and South LA was some, something that I didn't routinely do growing up. Uh, but when I moved back to LA and drove uh, to work, to campus, I'd find myself driving like this, looking out the window, wondering about the history of this community, the stories it has, the stories that could be told. And so the first project I did now, almost two years ago, was something called the On Jefferson Project. This was the route, the, the route, the street that I took to get onto campus. And I had my students stop talking about their, their classmates, the 21 flavor choices of frozen yogurt business profile, but to go along this route and tell me a good story from our community using this really cool nerdy tech stuff. Uh, and they did a really fantastic job. Uh, on my way here today, actually, I drove by the Church's Chicken off of uh, Western and Jefferson. And you probably didn't know this, but back in the day, that Church's Chicken was a German beer garden. There's a lot of history in this area. It has that uh, reputation of, of NWA and gangster rap and crime, but there's a lot of fantastic, incredible, rich history here. This is that corner of the, the former Church's Chicken and uh, former uh, beer garden turned Church's Chicken. Um, what I got out of this first project was, now I really drove like this, but whenever I had someone with me, I would point out, see that building right there? Right up here our architectural elements, um, let's see if it loads, architectural elements that talked about this building was more of a Jewish community building. Uh, talked about uh, the Japanese co uh, community that was here that were essentially escorted out through the Japanese internment camps. Lots of fantastic uh, musical history, uh, just rich history that made up this area. The idea of craftsman homes in the Pacific Northwest in most places, you want one of these homes because they're gorgeous. And here they are uh, with a community that was uh, manicured lawns and fantastic stories. And that was just uh, the history. We have art with the murals that you see that, that just cover up uh, so many buildings here. Uh, I have a student who did this. Let's see if we have I'm audio. I'm from Los Angeles, and I painted this mural that's behind me here. I'm pretty familiar with the neighborhood. I, I grew up hanging out a couple streets away the from The student here, found this mural and painting. found the artist that did this piece and interviewed them to talk about uh, the role of this mural. He paints photorealism portraits on a very large scale. Technically, he, he does the portrait. I do the lettering that's around it. But the whole thing is a collaborative process. The photograph is of a friend of ours. You know, he's into the... the native LA gang culture. You know, the idea behind the, the actual portrait was to depict something that was kind of universal. You know, some people thought he was African American, some people think he's Latin, and but actuality, he's actually Italian. Hi, my name is Peaches. So in this piece, uh, you get to, to experience the mural, uh, but it also gets decoded uh, by the artist and through the captions. What's wonderful here is, you know, our students have done really fantastic tech 
text pieces or have done fantastic broadcast pieces. And in my class, they mash them together. They do audio, they do photography, and here they did an audio slideshow. Um, that was the first time I did you know, this community-driven project. The next one I did was when I moved and I had to take another route here, uh, and it was MacArthur Park. Uh, we came up with this project called Two Blocks Around the Park. For many of us, we maybe know MacArthur Park from uh, Chinatown, uh, the movie Chinatown, and other uh, iconic films about Los Angeles. This was just a fantastic way to dive into this community um, in the heart of, of, of you know, LA that just represents so much of, of almost like a modern day pioneer town. You will see people there walking around, women walking around with uh, baby strollers with a blanket over them, but there's no baby there. They're selling tamales. They're selling uh, pupusas. They're selling sometimes medicine, 25 cents for a Tylenol, because that's what they have to do to survive to make a living. And amongst them, you're gonna find just the communities that have been there for generations. Uh, and just had fantastic stories. Again, uh, I had uh, one student found uh, an apartment loft that the owner uh, basically gave it over to artists and she wanted to create an interactive building to tell the stories of the different diverse artists that were there. So she coded up this interactive piece where you could uh, click and meet different people here, like meeting Carl, who talks about art. My name is Carl Ramsey. I'm a painter, and I, along with uh, Richard McDowell, opened Optical Illusion Gallery here at 2412 West 7th Street. My career goes back, it starts quite a while back. And I was an illustrator for everything but just about the past, uh, oh, 15, 20 years or so. When you th think of South LA, you may not be thinking about art, but this is a place that art is very much part of the, the fabric of the community. We had uh, profile pieces about um, a nonprofit that taught immigrants how to read and not read English. Many of them didn't even know how to speak Spanish. They were speaking indigenous languages that uh, we found this nonprofit, or actually the student found this nonprofit that taught uh, first time folks to read and did this thing called the Prezi, uh, where you interact with this slideshow and you meet the folks that are benefiting from this nonprofit uh, organization. Here you meet this character and he talks about the power of My reading. Name is Miguel Borcha. Soy de really Guatemala. moving stuff. Um, a couple of them break down crying, talking about the power just to read a sign. Uh, and the student did a fantastic job where he had them write an essay about uh, how they feel about learning this power to read, and he translated it to English. This is what modern journalism looks like. This is using technology, quite honestly, hijacking technology that may not have been made for journalism, but applying it to journalism. But not just any type of journalism, community journalism. Let me show you the last uh, project we did was uh, Main Street LA. Uh, this is a, a smaller class that had a fan. I chose uh, Main Street, just uh, east, of, east of campus, and selected 25 blocks. And I constrained my students and said, go out there and find me good stories based on this block. And they would groan and say, like, I'm not going to find anything. Boy, were they wrong. Uh, for example, this one student found an abandoned uh, gym that uh, was taken over from uh, a guy, a former boxer, in partnership with a local uh, church to, to offer boxing as an alternative to, to street life or gang life to kids. <laughs> My name is Sofia Sota and I'm barely nine years old. I'm turning ten in August. My dad, my dad and his best friend opened up this gym and I couldn't believe it and I thought it was really cool. And I even wrote it in my diary. I thought it was amazing. Yes, it can be old, but in this particular angle, she chose to talk to the daughter uh, of the owner, and it's just a very innocent, 
perfect different alternative point of view of how this gym has turned from this kind of a rundown place into the epicenter where uh, young men are learning how to box, uh, learning how to be street smart, but learning that within their community, uh, on their own, with community members. I had another one. Who's ever heard of Jerkin? Jerkin culture? Um, I had to look it up myself. Jerkin culture is, um, let's see if I can get to it here, is a dance craze essentially, uh, where instead of saggy pants, kids are looking like skaters with tight pants and doing crazy dance moves. Go to YouTube, look up Jerkin, try to do one of these dance moves. Don't hurt your back. Uh, and so it turns out that in that block, off that street, there is the Vlado streetwear, a uh, Vlado footwear. Uh, a woman created this shoe line specifically for jerk culture. You're a jerk. I'm not. You're a jerk. You're a jerk. I'm not. You're and instead jerk. of looking for trouble You're on the street, they would have dance off. Uh, My dance name is Jill the, uh, Kim, and I'm the CEO of Vlado Footwear. I have 15 years in the uh, footwear industry. I started out as a retailer, as a buyer, and um, I kind of fell in love with the shoe business, and I wanted to create our own brand and make it affordable, realistic prices without all those hidden costs for the... These are the stories of our community. These are the stories of the surrounding area. These are the stories of L.A., but more importantly, what we do here, this is journalism. This is telling our stories. Um, with that, uh, so we can have questions, we have the exhibits upstairs. Uh, I'm using this nerdy technology, the 360 panorama that you can, for some reason, you don't go upstairs. You can kind of see how the exhibit is set up. Uh, our students use this stuff. Our students, well, one student who found this church told me about uh, she found this old church that had a pink neon si uh, a cross with magenta bright pink carpeting. And I told her, words will not capture that. A photo will not capture that. Go do, me a, uh, do a 360 photo and put that in your story, which she did. Um, that's the type of journalism that we're doing. We're actively engaging with our community, and we're telling their stories. Thank you. We'd love to have questions for uh, Robert and Willa if, if any of you would. Yes? Well, I'd be interested maybe I'll direct this to Robert. Uh, in the sort of in the flow of your class over the semester, how much is it doing stories like this and how much is uh, the classroom and uh, sort of uh, uh, book learning and so on? How do you make that? So my class is Intro to Online Media, um, and I have to train them on all the different skill set that uh, a modern journalist must have, which is you know some basic HTML, photography, audio recording, audio slideshows, but again, all in the name of journalism. Um, you can talk to my students, and you can tell them that the uh, they'll tell you that the first half of the semester is a bit of a meat grinder. Um, every week they're going out to their community that they're covering and they're coming back with an audio slideshow with something relating to that area or to their beat. The second half, um, they, they spend, uh, which is where we are now, for the final project, uh, which are the pieces that I showed here, they go in deeper, they, they start you know, thinking longer term. What, now that I know this technology um, and I've done some reporting, how do I do a better job of a deeper story? Um, there is no textbook for my class because by the time the ink dries, it's irrelevant. So it is constantly learning and training. But the thing that, uh, outside of learning these basic technology things, the, the goal uh, for my students, or my goal for my students is that um, they function in this changing, uh, constantly evolving landscape. We're not transitioning from point A to point B. We're at our destination, which is constantly changing and transitioning and evolving. So I want them to be open to play with this technology. Many of them you know, may have used Twitter or Facebook for personal reasons as a civilian. I'm training them how to use it as a journalist, how to crowdsource, how to distribute their content, how to find stories. Um, so that's that balance that, that we do. Yes, right here.
I'm glad you asked that question because it's, it's often on the minds of, of parents and when we send out journalism students. What, what would you like to, how would you well, like to Well, this semester, um, I'm overseeing the five sections of the Intro to Online Media class and we're doing a partnership with KPCC, the NPR affiliate. Um, they have a, a community uh, blog called The On Central Blog. Um, and I brought in a speaker to talk to them to talk about the, the, the area, the demographics. But um, while it has a reputation of it being a dangerous place, that has not been my experience or the experience of my students. Um, they go out and they, they're not going there at night. They're not going in the back alleys. They're going and looking for stories. They're making appointments. Uh, they're engaging with, with the community. Um, the biggest uh, barrier that they tend to find is a lot of these uh, businesses and organizations don't have a website, so you just can't Google it in or phone it in. You physically have to go there and do those interviews. Um, and the second challenge is a lot of them don't, uh, well actually there's two more challenges. A lot of them don't speak English. So I had one student uh, that I thought, okay, this is going to be a challenge for her, but by the time she did the final, she learned how to say in Spanish, este es para un proyecto. She knew how to adapt to, to the situation to say, this is for a class project, was able to engage. Um, and then the other challenge is, is how uh, Judy and, and Willa talked about, the mainstream media isn't covering uh, this community. In fact, the only time it comes in is to amplify that something bad has happened. So there's this kind of distrust of, of, of journalists and outsiders, if you will, uh, initially. But the fact that we go back and have these relationships and tell these types of stories, um, that really opens the door. Uh, well, yeah. it's, you know, people, um, I'll just say this, because I, I send students out in my classes. I teach radio and television reporting, and uh, my radio students report for Annenberg Radio News, and part of their, they each have a beat, which is a community around uh, the university. And at first they're just, you know, I, what am I supposed to do? And I said, well, just go out and get to know the area first. Walk up and down the street, talk to people, see what's going on. The thing that, that most people understand, that you don't have to be introduced to a community. People are, love to talk about what's happening in their, in their neighborhoods, and nobody asks them. Um, I had students, well, what I do is when, when they say, I don't know what, where will I find a story? I've sent them out on a scavenger hunt. They have one hour. They got to get off campus and they got to get back. And the person with the best story wins. And that means they have to talk to people. And they come back with amazing stuff. One young woman found a quilting bee, this, these group of women who are by day in very stressful jobs. One was a parole officer, one uh, was down at the welfare office, and very stressful jobs. And once a month they meet, this is a great television piece, by the way, and make quilts and talk about their problems and talk about the stresses. And it was just this, it's the kind of thing that I want to steal immediately and do for, for ABC. You know, I mean, I, I'm always hearing these great stories that I want to steal. So really, it's just a matter of getting them out there and, and talking yeah, to Yeah, and people. I want to just reiterate what Robert said. I mean, I've been sending now students out for many, many years, and we've never had any student have a problem. And you know, one of the things that we tell them is, LA is a big city. You know, when you're walking across campus, you you know, you, you know, you could be, you know, uh, run over by a bicycle. <laughs> I mean, there's dangers everywhere, and you just have to you have to be defensive, especially when you're carrying equipment. And that's just the reality of being a broadcast <coughs> journalist. If you're if you have a video camera, or if you have an audio camera, or if you have a nice still camera, that you have to be careful. You have to watch what's around you. But that's wherever you go. That's not just South LA. And oftentimes, if, if we do ever feel like we're sending a student for a story into something that, into a place that might be considered sketchy, we make sure that there's two students that go. But I, that's just, we, there's never been an issue. And, and as Robert said, we're not saying, you know, go to the you know, dark corners in the middle of the night where the prostitution's happening so that you can get that. You know, no, we would never do that. We'd never put their safety in jeopardy. The worst thing that's happened to my student was that she was hit on <laughs> um, and whistled at or something like that. So I do want to share one story of uh, I don't know if you had him, Robbie, uh, he was on ATVN, Robbie, I'm ATVN. forgetting his name. yes. Uh, this is a red-headed kid who, when we were yes. covering uh, MacArthur Park, had this idea that said, you know what I want to do, Professor Hernandez, I want to have dinner at someone's house and see what they're eating. And I was like, Robbie, it's a great idea, but you kind of stand out. Um, if you want to do that, you go do that, 
and lo and behold, he did it. He, I don't know how he did it, uh, with folks that guest speakers that we brought in. I think he used them to talk to the community. But uh, a mother of two invited him over for dinner, talked about how uh, he, uh, the dinner that she cooked to kind of help her kids lose weight uh, because obesity is a big thing in the Latino community, and talked about uh, the challenges of getting healthy organic food, how she has to drive all the way to Trader Joe's outside of the neighborhood, you can't get anything healthy within her neighborhood. And it was a fantastic story that I had my doubts that he'd be, I wouldn't let him in my house to have dinner with me. I mean, who's this guy? Lo and behold, he was able to do it. Yes. For intersection South LA, um, our staff is changing. We have a very small staff, core staff. Um, we have a few students that work with us on a regular basis. Uh, and then one of the things that we do is we have, for instance, Robert's on Jefferson Project we put on intersections. Um, we have a, a story list that we send out to, to students every week. And students are allowed to, to use one of our story ideas for a class if they, if they need a story idea with the condition that we get the story when, after it's been handed in and graded. So we get a lot of stories that way. And then we have a core group of of students who volunteer and just they want to get that reporting experience. And the other thing that we're trying to give students experience with intersections is one of the big things that people are going to need to learn if they want to go into journalism is entrepreneurialism and how you look at web analytics and how you do civic engagement because you have to engage your audience and how you do social media to get people to your website. So that's another thing that we're you know, pulling students in to learn so that they can take advantage of of doing that on our site so that when they go out they can. And we've, I have a student that worked with us for two years who just graduated. She was considered for a couple of jobs that I don't think she would have even gotten in for an interview with if she hadn't been doing this. Yes. Yeah, in yes. my class it's just my students and myself. Right now it's in English only. We, um, our, our managing editor is Spanish speaking, so we're going to start getting some Spanish content in. And if we had, uh, it, I don't think we still teach a Spanish language news class in the school, but um, if we do have that again, then that's something that we might be able to take advantage of too. Is there a case on the site that people can post their own stories? Well, we're actually switching to a new um, content management system and new back end site and we're going to have that as part of it. We, we, we just don't have the um, technical capability to do that right now, but we will have that. Are you a news person? Yes, I, I can tell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> great yeah. question. Okay. Well, you could come and wait, wait, We have time for another question, I think. Anybody? Any? No? Well, thank you all for coming. We're so appreciative.